As a result of fluoridation, our children will be healthier and happier. Anotha Venegopal. My whole class decided to look into fluoride because we wanted to learn everything we could about it. At first, I was a bit indifferent about fluoridated water, sad to say. <laughs> Over the year, though, I discovered more about fluoride and now jump at almost every opportunity to argue against its presence in our water. I found that fluoride has been linked to osteoporosis, birth defects, dental fluorosis, skeletal fluorosis, possibly leading to lower IQ levels, and more. No fluoridation without representation. A gulp of fluoride water a day does not keep the doctors away. These are the words etched into some of the buttons children from my class have created. You may be wearing one of them now. These pretty pieces of political artwork symbolize only a small part of the work we have been doing after a long effort to discover the answer to whether or not fluoride should be added to our water. Using research, creating surveys, conducting science experiments on how fluoridated water affects plants, eggshells, chicken bones, and more to find out the truth about sodium fluorosilicate. Help us win the fight to get rid of our fluoride plight. Why even have fluoride in water when we can easily buy fluoride toothpaste if we choose to? We're not even being asked if we want this so-called medication in water. And finally, why do we drink fluoridated water if it can cause possible health problems? Join the fight to ban fluoride from water today. We are now number 42 in the, some of the data I looked at on the, the infant mortality list. In other words, 41 countries at least have infants that live at a higher rate than they do in the United States. And if you take, and we used to be in the top three for longevity. If you look at the infant mortality rate of the top four countries, which includes Sweden, Finland, uh, I think uh, Singapore, and some others, and you subtract that level, from the death rate in the United States, they're roughly one-third the death rate of what we see in the United States. And if you consider our total population, almost 18,000 babies a year die in the United States that would not die if we had the infant death rate of uh, Sweden. You know, you bring up an interesting point about the uh, fluoridation without representation. I mean, I'm talking about the health, the health problems with this now. But on a greater level, this is forced medication of the public because the government says so. What's next? They don't think we're happy enough, so they put some Xanax in our water supply because they're allowed to because there's a government? It's outrageous. And everyone you hear supporting this down the road is going to be someone working for the government or some industry that's supported by the government or group. And they, they have these, whack, these, these fancy names, but they're all supported by either the drug industry or by the government when you hear from them. Water fluoridation is not a conspiracy. It's a policy. It's a policy that's protected by the United States EPA and the FDA. It's a policy that is promoted by the Center for Disease Control, the United States Public Health Service, the American Dental Association, and the American Medical Association. They're using hazardous waste and adding it to our water supply because they've got a lot of it to get rid of. There's no reason for it. It doesn't do anything to improve the health of this country, and I believe it's destroying the fabric of our nation. In April of 1985, I was in the hallway of the East Tower at Waterside Mall in Washington, and a friend of mine who was writing the fluoride and drinking water standard um, stopped me, and he was really, really frustrated because uh, he was being told that he wanted to set the standard at two milligrams per liter. He thought that's, that was easily justified, but they told him they didn't want it to, they wanted it four. He was called to the uh, director's office and told that what he was going to do. So he had to go back and alter the scientific document to support a higher number. Um, so it was originally intended to be much half of what it is, what it is now. Um, I found out after much investigation it actually should be much lower. And if we, uh, we'll get to talk later about, I hope, about the National Academy of Sciences report. But um, 
when he when he told me this that he was being forced to lie basically i got really really interested and i thought you know this is going to be this is something we need to run up the flagpole and get uh, draw people's attention to and maybe we can get a change of climate in the agency to do something about this we started writing letters to the administrator it totally ignored us never got responses to anything it was as if we didn't even exist we became aware once we, we heard that the agency wanted to set the drinking water standard at 4 ppm, uh, we started digging into this. We went to look at the criteria document that was to be the agency's uh, scientific justification for, for that and found out a couple of things. One, that it was d written by a contractor, it, was, it wasn't done by EPA staff people. Uh, they had ignored uh, uh, quite a bit of the data on some um, critical uh, toxicity points, not only the high incidence of dental fluorosis that would occur, but also a mutagenicity, and there were some indications of carcinogenicity that were just not showing up in, in the criteria document. Uh, Dr. Carton and I went to see the head of the drinking water office at that time and asked uh, that the people who wrote that criteria document come and give a seminar very much like Dr. Yamianis had given us one and to justify the conclusions that were in the, uh, in the uh, criteria document. And the drinking water office said, oh no, we're not going to do that. Um, no, there was a notice and comment period and that's all closed and uh, th this is a closed issue, we're not going to get into that. And so um, <laughs> that started the long train of, of uh, suspicion which continues to this very day about what EPA's complicity is in, in national program for water fluoridation. Well, one of the things that developed out of this uh, uh, finding that the agency wasn't going to um, really take a hard look at the science, um, we were contacted by the uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, which had a lawsuit against EPA uh, involving this uh, drinking water standard. And they asked if, if uh, we would write a, an amicus curiae brief to enter into that lawsuit. And uh, they said, if you guys will write the science part, we'll take care of the legal part. And we said, well, absolutely. And so um, uh, Dr. Carton did basically all of the scientific writing uh, in connection with that uh, amicus brief. Worked with the uh Lady uh, Nora Chorover was the uh, woman responsible for writing it. She was absolutely brilliant. And uh, I worked with her to put together the amicus brief, which really uh, very simply detailed the fact that the agency had not determined what dose people uh, should be getting that would be safe. And we went through all of the, uh, all of the logical arguments about how much people drink, uh, you know, what is the lowest effect level and all the things that they really hadn't determined. They, they, they avoided trying to, trying to uh, uh, give real specific information in the regulation so that they couldn't be held accountable, you know. Uh, but the judges, uh, the three judges, the District Court of uh, District of Columbia, uh, refused to allow it in court. If we'd been allowed in court, uh, this, that standard would have been dead in the water because we, we knew what the story was and we represented the, the experts at the agency who the, the agency had to call upon to justify their standard. So if they ever had to call upon our own people, they, they would never have been able to justify the standard. So the court wouldn't allow it because they didn't want to have that conflict, I guess. And uh, uh, by doing so, of course, the truth never got out. Well, e EPA is fighting really hard to uh, avoid getting in the way of uh, the Department of Health and Human Services national program for water fluoridation. Uh, they want to play the good federal soldier, um, and they don't want to take the political heat that would certainly come down on them if they came out and said, uh, uh, you know, the appropriate standard for fluoride is considerably less than one part per million. It would, if, the, if EPA did that, that would be the end of the national f uh, program for water fluoridation because you couldn't have the premier environmental agency saying one thing and the Department of Health and Human Services saying something else. Instead, what you got was EPA coming up with this phony four parts per million uh, level, uh, the so-called 
maximum contaminant level goal, as it's now called, uh, as a health-based standard. And so now the proponents of water fluoridation uh, since 1985-86 have been able to go around the country saying, well, look, EPA says four parts per million is perfectly safe. There's not a problem with that. So what's the big deal by putting, you know, adjusting your level to one part per million? And so EPA is uh, staying on the good side of the um, federal structure by doing that kind of thing. Time to mention Dr. Bill Marcus because he's the uh, was the uh, chief toxicologist for the Office of Drinking Water, who found out they did a the government did a cancer study on fluoride, and he found out that the raw data did not fit the conclusions in the report, and he called for an investigation and a reopening of it, and um, he gave it to me, and I said, do you mind if I leak this to the press? He said no, and uh, so I did, and he got fired, which. Uh, I'm really sorry. Uh, sorry about it. I'm. 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 I'm really glad he did it. But uh, sorry that the, the pain and suffering he's gone through. He went through two and a half years without a job as a result. My job was to give my management the facts. Their job was to decide what they were going to do about it, and that's the way it stood. My memo memorandum was uh, um, scooped up by one of my colleagues, Bob Carton, who uh, was on a. a committee that the agency had put together to review fluoride and it then involved all the program offices, not just the Office of Drinking Water. And he, re he re released that memo to the public and uh, explained what it meant to Roberta Vasquez. And, and I'm sitting home one night and there it is appearing on the screen of my TV set, my memorandum. And that's where all the problems began for me personally. Everyone agrees including the American Dental Association, the National Academies of Science, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, that the dose of fluoride a baby received on fluoridated tap water formula exceeds the amount known to cause harm. Why is that okay? Why are we allowing that? Meet the whistleblowers and the scientists that will tell you what's going on and will tell you how to stop it. Whistleblowing is very simple. It's people who expose wrongdoing in the government or big companies that can harm the public interest. Someone blows the whistle on environmental violations, chemicals that could cause public health risks, rip off of taxpayer money. Uh, you may remember some of the more famous whistleblowers like Sharon Watkins, who knew that Enron was engaged in fraudulent activity, uh, Fred Whitehurst from the FBI Crime Lab, forensic fraud etc. Uh, there are people who put their lives and careers and jobs at risk to tell the truth. In about 1994, Dr. Marcus uh, came to my office. Uh, he was about to be fired from the EPA, uh, although he was an absolutely distinguished and long-standing scientist with unparalleled uh, reputation and uh, credentials. He showed me a memo he wrote on the fluoride issue that indicated that fluoride could have severe adverse health effects on people. Uh, and he had recommended additional research be conducted within the agency to make sure that the amount of fluoride that was added to drinking water was safe. And he showed me other documents that indicated that the agency was very upset with him for this recommendation and, in fact, had initiated its campaign to fire him. This document was properly prepared uh, within the context of his job as a senior science advisor, meaning the highest level scientist within EPA who's non-supervisory. He's like the guru scientist you go to for the tough issues. And Dr. Marcus reviewed the literature, reviewed the materials before him, and set forth basic scientific facts in this document to his supervisors and said, we need to study this matter because if fluoride does pose a health risk, 
we have to monitor how much we put in the drinking water or if we should put in any at all. The agency decided that I uh, uh, did it on purpose and uh, uh, wanted to change uh, public policy as an individual rather than going through the agency's uh, uh, procedures, which was totally untrue. And uh, um, they decided that rather than deal with me on, on a scientific basis, they would uh, uh, um, find an excuse to uh, uh, fire me. The Inspector General went to great lengths to uh, uh, fabricate material to show that I was doing terrible things. They, uh, they fabricated a time card and claimed that I had stolen time. The Inspector General was called in by the agency to try to develop a case against Dr. Marcus. It was an underhanded play. The IG should be investigating companies and polluters, not scientists, but they came in and ran an investigation that was a sham. We subpoenaed the Inspector General. We knew the investigation was a sham. And they called the investigator, the chief investigator in from maternity leave. And she admitted as we deposed her, she opened up the file, she carefully reviewed each document, and then put notes and other information into the shredder and destroyed them forever. Consequently, the role of industry in conspiring to destroy Dr. Marcus's career was covered up. Because we believe that this wasn't just an EPA attack, it was EPA doing the bidding of powerful, special interests. The agency actually fired Dr. Marcus, its senior science advisor, its only board certified toxicologist. They fired him. And we had a, took it to trial, a full-scale trial for a number of weeks in front of a Department of Labor judge. He heard both sides and ruled down the line for Dr. Marcus. His memo was legally protected. The agency retaliated against him because he wrote a memo criticizing fluoride and calling for more research. And his termination was reversed. He was reinstated with back pay and damages for, for his loss of reputation. He received all attorney's fees and costs. The decision was upheld on appeal and he was returned to work to the agency as its senior science advisor. The outcome was that I won my case because it was shown that all the charges they had made were uh, uh, untrue, with the exception of uh, one, which was that I uh, used the wrong pronoun. And when they had been giving testimony to help people who were um, injured by large corporations, I had used the term we referring to EPA's activities instead of EPA. That should have been the end of it. They should have stopped harassing Dr. Marcus and started listening to their board-certified senior science advisor. The EPA did not fix the problem. They didn't suspend or fire the employees who had engaged in illegal retaliation. They remained in place. So when he was returned to work, the same managers who fired him in the same chain of command was in place to continue harassing him. So we had to file a second lawsuit to force them to stop the harassment. And guess what? We had a full trial on the merits and we won the second lawsuit. I do not know why the agency did what it did to Dr. Marcus, but I do represent whistleblowers. And I can tell you, they went after Dr. Marcus with a vengeance, a vengeance. He was a board certified toxicologist with years of seniority, one of the most respected tox the most respected toxicologist in the agency with an international reputation. And when he wrote that memo, they went after him like he was an enemy of the state. They just hammered and hammered and hammered. And they went way over the line by destroying evidence, and obstructing justice. And even after we won the first case and was ordered reinstated, they went after him again. And even though there were two court rulings finding retaliation, 
They never touched or disciplined those agency officials involved. This case marks a black mark on the EPA and raises fundamental issues about scientific freedom and about fluoride and why this agency went against one of its most respected scientists on that issue. They went after Bill Marcus with a vengeance because he knows the answer to the toxicological question. Fluoride causes cancer. And they had to shut him up because it would destroy their policy. So what are these people doing? They're breaking their oath of office in order to protect a policy. Shredding documents, committing perjury, forgery, witness tampering in order to protect a policy because it's part of a national security program to protect fluoride. They think they're protecting their nation. Instead, they're destroying it. At the um, Environmental Protection Agency, we were given a mandate under the Safe Drinking Water Act to look at um, different compounds and uh, uh, determine uh, what the uh, safe level was in drinking water. Through the course of time, fluoride was one of the ones chosen. And as the uh, senior scientist at the uh, Office of Drinking Water at the time, to me, fluoride was just another one, one of these compounds. It came to our attention that there was a large study which showed that rats got cancer of the bone, and they got a very unusual cancer of the liver. Now, that was extremely surprising. First of all, to produce cancer of the bone in rodents is never seen because the time that you have between the birth and death of a rodent is only three and a half, four years. And uh, it usually takes longer than that to produce a cancer in bone. The cancer of the liver was extremely rare, also shown to occur. And the fact that it happened meant that it was significant. It just doesn't happen. I uh, wrote this memo in which I explained that I thought fluoride was a carcinogen and that we had as much evidence with the animal studies to show that it was a carcinogen than, than we had with any of the other compounds and therefore uh, should be treated as such. I'm Dr. Yolanda White. I'm a pediatrician, so I protect the health, safety, and well-being of children. So many kids have dental fluorosis now, which is a sign of chronic fluoride overexposure and toxicity. Those white stains in the teeth, they reflect a reduced mineral content. And it's not just children who are affected. Everyone is affected, but even affects the unborn child because fluoride can cross the placenta and it can cross the blood-brain barrier. And when it does that, it can lower IQ and even affect other neurodevelopmental outcomes. So this is very serious. I became interested in the issue of disproportionate harm to minorities from fluoridation for several reasons. Uh, first of all, as a public health professional, I had done some minority health work in my career. Um, I also saw in a publication called Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report from the CDC in 2005, they had some information that they shared. Buried in the back of this um, study that they published was a little table, and it showed that black Americans and Hispanics had disproportionate amounts of dental fluorosis. And I was intrigued by this and, and disturbed by it, actually. There's many different health effects that, that show up from, from fluoride. I think uh, Dr. Yamiata said there's something like 30 enzyme systems that are affected, but the, the uh, most obvious one is the dental fluorosis. Surgeon General of the Public Health Service was asked to give advice on the subject, so he formed a committee on non-dental effects. He had one on dental effects and one on non-dental effects. When they met, they uh, discussed dental fluorosis and said that you'd have to have you know, rocks in your head to allow your own kids to get dental fluorosis. And as a result, when they put their report out, they did call it an adverse health effect. Well, the report never made it to the public. Uh, it, it went up the line and someone altered it and changed the language in the report. And they changed many other things too, which uh, I don't have time to go into, but the, the most important one is that they changed the dental fluorosis statement from an uh, adverse health effect to a cosmetic effect. And uh, there's a writer by the name of Dan Grossman who uh, 
investigative journalist who uh, looked into this and found out that the people on the committee had, had no knowledge of the fact that it had been changed. They were never asked to agree to it. So it basically does not represent, as it says it does, it doesn't represent the real deliberations of the committee. In 1998, in the Wall Street Journal, the Center for Disease Control acknowledged that 22% of the children already had dental fluorosis. Now, more than a decade later, they've doubled the number of children with dental fluorosis, and a lot of it's severe, and a lot of it in the African-American and Hispanic communities. What is it about dental fluorosis that you don't understand? It's an adverse health effect, and they need to stop causing it. In Atlanta, Georgia, a number of civil rights leaders have stepped up to the plate to fight silica fluoride in the drinking water. It's a civil rights issue. You have injury to their children, they're fighting it because they don't want their children to be injured by silica fluoride any longer. First of all, I had very little knowledge about fluoride in the drinking water. As most people in the African-American community, we are not familiar with this. Most are still not familiar. But a friend of mine named Laura Seidel, who's very much involved with Captain Planet and many of the environmental issues around the country, uh, called me and asked me would I meet with uh, a man named Daniel Stockton and another person from the Lilly Center. So uh, myself and uh, Ambassador Andy Young met with them and we looked at much of the information. We looked at what fluoride was doing to the teeth. We heard a lot of the information and about this uh, particular ingredient in our water and in our toothpaste. So consequently, we began to do a little more research on it, and we wanted to know how did it disproportionately impact on the people that we're called to serve in the African-American community. As a public health person, I knew that the black community and Hispanics and other minorities um, are disproportionately harmed by kidney disease and diabetes. Yet those were two of the populations that the National Research Council said were susceptible subgroups, particularly vulnerable to harm from fluoride. Then on top of it, I found, of course, and we've all known this, and a lot of folks in public health know that uh, minority communities often have a poorer nutritional status. So when you add poor nutrition with added fluoride, the effect gets magnified of the harm from fluorides. We are chemical systems. Toxins have such a huge effect on human behavior. And it's really important to understand this because the silico fluorides increase the absorption of the toxins. Lead levels absorbed by blacks in the United States are higher than lead levels absorbed by whites. A survey of children's blood lead, uh, that's called the National Health and Nutrition Evaluation Survey data set, counties over 500,000 population, big cities. And if you look at this chart, you'll see that these are the blacks, these are Hispanics, and these are whites. And this is where there is no silico fluoride in the water, and this is where there's silico fluoride in the water. And you'll notice that there are two things that are going on. First of all, the blacks have higher levels of their lead of lead than the whites. And where there's silico fluoride, there's higher level. But there's a third thing, which is the difference between these two graphs is bigger for blacks than it is for whites. Cholesterol, cardiovascular diseases, these are diseases which disproportionately impact the African-American community. A lot of times it's because of diet. A lot of times it's because uh, we get the information on health later than many other communities. So we, this is one we want to be the headlight instead of the tail light when it comes to the water that we drink. Um, so this is why, and particularly in the South, because it is so warm, the humidity is so high, we tend to drink a lot of water. And so we need the best level of of uh, safety in our drinking water as possible. And don't forget, we also bathe with fluoridated water and skin absorption studies have not been done. Uh, fluoride is a toxin and toxin is another word for poison. And how do we know this? Well, the CDC has a toxicology profile for fluoride. And not only that, but the EPA also has established reference doses for fluoride, which is only done for toxic substances. I found this water. Uh, there, there's some waters that are available out there today. 
Um, and for instance, this is a bottled water that is sold uh, for use in preparing milk formula and for babies. And the thing about it is, is that if you happen to be someone who can't afford to buy this bottled water, perhaps you're a member of a minority community who has a lower household income, what are you supposed to do? Do you not count? Do, do you not matter? Does your babies not matter? So I saw a whole series of issues, particularly about disproportionate harm to minority communities. And this really pricked my conscience and I, I couldn't be quiet about it. And that's why we really began to reach out to members of the black community and Hispanic community to talk about harm from fluoride. We're finding out that babies who drink formula that's been mixed with fluoridated water, they're actually receiving the highest dose amongst all of us. So therefore, they're at highest risk. And this is while their bodies are still developing and still forming. And this is despite the American Academy of Pediatrics policy statement that warns against fluoride in children under six months old. Their dose of fluoride is so high that it exceeds the EPA's safe uh, reference dose. And so this is so alarming, especially being that there are no health or safety warnings or advisories. So parents don't even know that they have to protect their children. I was asked by my supervisor uh, to find out why um, children who are uh, uh, Hispanic and uh, uh, black have higher levels of lead in their blood than white folks. It turns out that there are uh, alleles that control the amount of material that is uh, absorbed, such as lead, arsenic, heavy metals. Black children have two alleles that increase the absorption rate. Hispanic children have one allele that does and one that doesn't. And Caucasian children have the slowest rate of absorption. I found that extremely disturbing, and I, and I wrote several uh, um, memoranda suggesting that uh, uh, the levels we were setting that were acceptable of lead were uh, unacceptable for blacks and for Hispanics because they, they would absorb more given the same exposure. And what a lot of people don't understand, because why would we know about this, is that alloys in brass and bronze and things like this, some of our plumbing fixtures, these plumbing fixtures have lead in them. And, um, and sometimes our, our plumbing lines have lead in them. So the fluoridated water, in some instances, where there is the right chemistry in the water, can actually pull lead into the water. The fluorides can help pull lead into the water. So, you know, maybe it's a little bit of lead, but the point is, is that uh, any lead at all, this is something your body doesn't need. It's, it's been stated to me that if we come out and speak about these issues in terms of fluoridated water and the impact, that there might be people in higher up positions that might become somewhat angered, disgruntled. Uh, people might say that they don't have all of the facts, and I wouldn't argue with that. We don't have all of the facts. But they said that if you begin to speak out against this, it might get a little, a little heat might be put on you. And I said that if you can't stand the heat, you need to get out of the kitchen. And I think that that's quite important that for those of us who are beginning to try to understand this, that we raise the pertinent issues that can improve the lives of our children and those that we're called to serve. To, to understand how it is that lead or silicon fluoride should affect, affect behavior and change the way we behave or think, you have to understand how the brain works just normally. Uh, we know there are some, some people who have learning disabilities of uh, particular kinds and that has to do with some part of that system really does not function normally. But let me just talk about the, 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 the basic pattern of the system. You have these uh, neurons or brain cells and each one when a current comes through, or an impulse comes through, when something is released across that membrane, at the other end of the receptor cell, it's called the receptor, there's, it's, it's the equivalent of putting a plug in a wall plug. Because there's a, when, when a chemical gets into this receptor, it fires the same impulse that came, was coming down that previous cell. So if you have some lead in there, it can block the transmission, like putting chewing gum in a, in a light socket. Lead interferes with dopamine, which interferes with learning, 
and then you have effects on the brain size, then you have lifelong effects. And if these effects are worse for poor children than for rich children, and I've got statistics that's the case, because poor children have less calcium in their diet, lead and calcium have both the same electronic charge, they're divalent cations, they have an electric charge of two electrons, so that you have a particular place in a protein and there's supposed to be a calcium there. If there's no calcium, the lead can stick there, change the shape of the protein, the protein doesn't work. So there, there are a number of different pathways. I don't understand any of these fully. I may be wrong on one or more of them. But there are so many different pathways by which lead and the use of silicon fluorides harm young children. We can't get rid of all the lead in the environment very easily, but we can easily get rid of water in the silicon fluoride in the glass the child drinks. All we have to do is that the water company turn the knob off. That's not very hard. Why has the public health community and why has the medical community and the fluoridation the supporting community, why have they not actively shared with minority communities the whole story about fluorides. If fluorides are so safe and good in mom's apple pie and all American, then certainly they would stand up to some kind of scrutiny and closer examination. But when I, when I began to uh, address minority health departments in government agencies, I, I, for instance, in the state of Tennessee, I was told that the minority health folks would not talk to me anymore. And then um, I, we began to approach this issue with the Centers for Disease Control and other places around the country. And over and over and over again, we found out that when we posed the question about how do we reach out to the black community, how come the black community hasn't been told, the leaders of the black community, et cetera, we got silence or they changed the subject. Even United States senators and representatives wouldn't pursue this subject. It's just, it's, it's one of those things that nobody wants to touch with a 10-foot pole. Because the facts are, minorities are disproportionately harmed by water fluoridation and other fluorides from, from other sources. We, as a people, must be concerned about the welfare and the health of all people. There are certain issues that tend to get swept under the rug. We've got to lift the rug, look at these issues for the good of the people. One of those is fluoridated water and the, what's in water. And we've got to, in some way, get all of the research necessary uh, and remove it if it is detrimental. I tend to believe that it is harmful. So if we're to make a difference, we've all got to come together. We've got to come together as parents. We've got to come together as clergy. We've got to come together as science. We've got to come together as legislators and medical professions. We've all got to come together. And if we all can come together around this issue, we can find out where the truth is, and if we can find out the truth, then we can make a difference. And I think that that's what we are all called to do. I think everybody in this, whether they're on one side or the other on the issue, we're all concerned about how do we become a healthier people who can really have a beautiful smile like this. There is very little information that is made available to members of the minority communities. And, and let's be honest about it, there's perhaps less access to computers or maybe less access to the internet. And maybe there's issues with second languages and, and primary languages. So my concern was, we're all Americans and it seems to me that all Americans deserve to hear the whole story about fluorides, not just the benefits, but what about how this affects members of the black community or Hispanics or American Indians or, you know, other um, or Asians. So we began to push the story and over and over again, we met with resistance. The good news is, is the thing is cracking open now. Members of the Hispanic community and the black community have been given this information and they're waking up to it and saying, this is just not right. What are the people in our community supposed to do who can't afford unfluoridated water? What are they supposed to do if they can't afford to fix their teeth from the damage that fluoride causes to their teeth? Some things just need to go away. Fluoridation is one of them. Severely vulnerable subset are, are people with uh, kidney malfunctions. Um, the, uh, uh, the 
a kidney that's not functioning properly will not remove fluoride from the bloodstream and the fluoride concentrations build up to dangerous levels. In fact, there have been reports of, uh, uh, there have been some deaths, there were some deaths in Chicago from use of tap water in, in hemodialysis, people who were on hemodialysis because of kidney failure. Um, and uh, normally they use distilled water in that hemodialysis system and they were using tap water instead and basically uh, killed s several people in, uh, because of the fluoride exposure. So chronic, uh, chronic kidney disease is, uh, is, a, is a real concern. I first became interested in the issue of the impact of fluoridated water on kidney patients um, when I came across a document from the National Kidney Foundation. It's a pretty old document, and I was concerned about the fact that the National Research Council had said that kidney patients and diabetics were what they called susceptible subpopulations that are especially vulnerable to um, harm from ingested fluorides. So when I saw this paper from the Kidney Foundation, and I knew that the National Research Council had a lot more current information, I contacted the uh, National Kidney Foundation. And um, some other folks also contacted NKF. And um, it, was, it was a very interesting thing to watch as this whole thing unfolded because I visited a dialysis center and I talked to physicians and I talked to kidney patients. There was, from the people I talked with, there was virtually no knowledge about the fact that kidney patients are particularly vulnerable to harm from ingested fluorides. And given the fact that one in nine American adults now have some form of chronic kidney disease, one in nine, the numbers are staggering. So I was concerned if you have that many people who are at risk uh, for or who have kidney issues and fluorides can, can affect either the kidney itself or because the kidneys don't work, the fluorides can collect in the bones at a fast, faster rate because the kidney function is not there to excrete the fluorides. This was very disturbing for me. And so uh, I also began to look, I was concerned about the fact that certain other groups were at higher risk for kidney failure or chronic kidney disease. So this is what kind of pulled us into the issue here at the Lilly Center um, about reaching out to kidney patients because when we did look out to kid for kidney patients, we found virtually no knowledge in the kidney patient population or in the caregivers about the latest information about harm from fluoride. In spite of the science becoming more and more uh, solid, irrefutable, that uh, fluoride causes real problems such as osteosarcoma, it causes a loss of uh, uh, mental acuity, and in combination with lead, is probably far worse than uh, either alone. No one has taken the responsibility to uh, uh, reevaluate what the levels of either should be in drinking water. I don't know exactly how I would attack that, but it appears to me uh, uh, when the lead was looked at that there was no level which lead did not produce an adverse effect. And I expect the same is true of uh, fluoride. So you would put them together. That it, my guess is it isn't just additive, it's multiplicative. But nobody is willing to do the study to determine uh, what actually happens. There are lots of reasons to believe it's occurring nationwide based on the LSAT studies uh, in which uh, the children are doing more poorly now than they were in the 50s before fluoride became much more widespread in its use. And uh, uh, this is very, very bad because uh, the number of children uh, who become adults whose IQs are above 120 uh, is significantly reduced, and that's a terrible loss to the country. From a legal perspective, there's a number of there are a number of questions that come to mind. One of them is the question of who holds the legal liability for uh, the injuries that result from fluoride exposure, and obviously. You know, one of the obvious, uh, in the legal context, defendants or one of the obvious uh, parties that holds liability are those water providers that have decided to put uh, fluoride into the water and expose the population to fluoride and to, and therefore to the harmful effects of fluoride. Um, certainly the water providers are, are a potential defendant or a potential uh, party with liability in this context.
Some people think they can avoid the problem of fluoridated tap water by buying bottled water. And if you purchased this water, you'd be right, because it's really low in fluoride. But if you read the label, you'd never know that. If you bought it in France, where it's bottled, they tell you how much mineral content of fluoride they have. In this country, they tell you how much fat there is in it. We have a ridiculous label system in this country. And if you happen to buy this water, it's the same as your fluoridated tap water. But it still tells you about the fat and the sugar. We've got ridiculous labels. But you can't avoid fluoride by just watching your lips because aren't you gonna go to a restaurant and have coffee? Aren't you gonna take a shower? It goes right through your skin. You can't avoid it. And if you just protect your own lips, the baby still ends up poisoned. That's not appropriate, I don't think. Babies drink a tremendous amount of fluoride, much more than was ever needed or ever recognized as being uh, to an advantage as far as tooth decay. And I, and I think the studies are showing that even that's questionable, whether or not fluoride reduces tooth decay at a, a significant uh, amount to make it worthwhile for all the money we put into paying people to put fluoride in our water. There are a lot of uh, advocacy groups, the American Dental Association, the American Medical Association, that have publicly promoted the use of fluoride, uh, not just in dental products, but also in community water supplies. And so those parties that may have been engaged in the promotion without discussion of the negative harmful side effects and the risks associated, they may also face some uh, criticism and possibly legal liability ultimately um, for the harms that have come out of the use of fluoride. People who say that the fluoride and fluoridating water is safe absolutely do not know the science. They don't even pay any attention to it because the science is totally against putting fluoride, you know, at large in drinking water. There's nothing published that would support this except their claims which are kind of wild, old, and probably ill-founded. Not only is fluoride added to public water supplies, but fluoride is also added to bottled water. And there are brands of bottled water that are marketed to children for the purpose specifically of healthy teeth that have added fluoride in them. And so uh, you have children who are born and raised on this water with parents thinking that it's a benefit to the child that um, may in fact be harming the child, not just with dental fluorosis from early life exposure, but also uh, some of these other effects that we've seen, the kidney damage, and some of the other effects that may affect these uh, people not just as children, but as also adults and throughout their lifetime. So again, we have bottled water providers that are now added to the mix and that may face some potential liability uh, for claims of damages related to fluoride exposure. You can also look at the, the healthcare products industry, for example, uh, Colgate Palmolive, you got Colgate toothpaste that is clearly being marketed to children uh, but this toothpaste has a warning that it's poison, but it does not have a warning about what the effects may be. So there's no warning about kidney damage, there's no warning about dental fluorosis. Uh, so certainly the healthcare products industry or the toothpaste manufacturers um, could also be another party that has liability for these damages. The question about whether the FDA has done any approval is an important aspect of it. And so the first thing, part of the, of, the, of the answer to that is no, the FDA has never approved any fluoride for ingestion for the purpose of reducing tooth decay. And that's of any form and of any kind, including what we normally would think of as being drops or tablets that are in vitamins that are typically utilized by prescription for children in non-fluoridated communities. So they've never approved it. Fluoride ends up in your milk. It ends up in uh, uh, the beer you drink, the wine you drink. Every fruit juice you take that's diluted and made from concentrate has fluoride. So right now what we have is a country that's being overdosed with fluoride because of the massive uh, water fluoridation that the cities have picked up by the inducement of the uh, American Dental Association with absolutely no positive benefit. A major question has to do with, well, who's responsible for the, the, the accountability for the safety and effectiveness or for the claims that are made of safety and effectiveness. And then and the normal assumption is that somehow the EPA is responsible for the safety and effectiveness and that they've done some kind of approval for it. So the, the proponents of fluoridation would tell you that that's the, sub, that's the true 
authority when in fact it's not at all. In uh, 1988, the uh, uh, EPA gave up all oversight responsibility for direct water additives. That includes fluoride, but includes all of the direct water additives. And they, it, so from that, this point forward, there are no really truly what we call federal safety standards that have to do with direct water additives at all. So, however, even if they had done so, the FDA has never given up uh, the authority for making a determination um, of safety and effectiveness and being allowed to make the claims. The experiment's been done, and the guinea pigs were American children. If you go to the countries that have the lowest infant death rate, Sweden, Finland, and, and Norway, and some of the others, which don't have the real nice weather and that we have in the United States with the housing, etc., they don't allow fluoridation of water. They don't allow mercury to be put in amalgam fillings. They don't allow thimerosal or mercury to be put in the injections given to the baby, and they don't inv inject or vaccinate babies on the day of birth. So we have a total failure in our government's ability to evaluate the health of our system. And we just go through and whatever the medical doctors want to do or whatever the dentists want to do, we support it, even though it may be totally mindless from a scientific viewpoint. This fluoridation propaganda film was made in the 1950s to deceive the American public. What's this guy tell you what they're using to fluoridate? Chlorine are added to the water before it enters the mixing basin. Sulfur dioxide and sodium fluoride are added after the water leaves the settling basin. By the time they made this film, they'd stopped using sodium fluoride and began to use hydrofluosilicic acid. The charcoal to remove odors and taste and this fluoride to reduce the amount of tooth decay. Claiming fluoride reduces tooth decay makes it a drug. The FDA has never approved any fluoride containing drug to be swallowed to reduce tooth decay. Here is water produced under the most exacting conditions containing a safe, controlled amount of sodium fluoride which will reduce tooth decay in our children. The product that's typically added to the water under fluoridation programs is called hydroflucilicic acid. It's a very specific kind of fluoride. And in fact, what we find is that the majority of people are confused because they think that, they think of fluoride as the substance that they either have in their toothpaste or that they might be added to water without recognizing the full spectrum of fluorides that are out there that affect us virtually every day. So the hydroflucilicic acid is a very specific kind of uh, fluoride that, that is utilized. And it, typically comes from the phosphate fertilizer industry, used to be almost exclusively from there. Um, and that particular product actually comes from the scrubber systems of, that are required by the Clean Air Act to make certain that these same kind of fluoride product is not emitted into the air. Water fluoridation is morally and ethically wrong. We're not giving people informed consent. It doesn't work if you swallow it. It's hazardous waste in the public water supply. It's an inexpensive way for industry to dispose of their waste product, but it destroys the nation. It causes disproportionate harm. Some people are injured more than others, but all of us are being injured by a policy. And it won't stop until you make them because it's saving billions of dollars to the industry that makes phosphate fertilizer in China, Japan, Mexico. It's time for it to stop. There's no argument about us having one of the highest infant death rates of the modern world. This problem is the problem that belongs to the United States Public Health Service, the NIH, the FDA, the CDC, the EPA, and every other health agency in the states that we exist in. Why are our children dying at such a high rate? Why are our elderly dying at a faster rate and at younger ages than people in other 28 other countries when we supposedly have the best medical care in the world? There is something dramatically wrong, and I think what's dramatically wrong is the approval of using things like mercury in fillings, which have been eliminated in Sweden, fluoride in the drinking water, the absurd use of extreme vaccination. I mean, we have more than uh, roughly four times the vaccines being given in the United States to prevent death from infectious diseases of countries that have probably uh, one third our infant death rate. If all of these things worked, if amalgams were so good, if fluoridation prevented caries, if vaccines prevented death from infectious diseases and caused infants to live longer, we would have one of the lowest infant death rates in the world. And in contrast, we have one of the highest.
In a series of experiments in 1978, Schubert showed that if you take enough mercury to kill one out of a hundred rats, one out of a hundred rats dies. And if you took enough lead to kill one out of a hundred rats and diluted it by twenty-fold, that none of the rats died. But if you added the lead, an infinitesimal amount, one twentieth of an LD1 and the mercury, an LD1, together, you killed all the rats. That makes mercury and lead together hugely synergistic. Well, when you put silicon fluoride in the water supply, you're giving the baby lead. And when you have vaccines with mercury in them, like the flu vaccine, you're giving them mercury. So the water supplies of this country are contaminated with silicon fluoride intentionally by a government program. That needs to stop. It's poisoning the babies. We have a program in this country called WIC, Women, Infant, and Children, that is supposed to be telling mothers, indigent mothers, how to feed and protect and grow up a healthy baby. We've contacted them and asked them if they're telling mothers to not use tap water formula, and no, they're not. You know why? Because it would affect the policy of fluoridation. These women need to know they're poisoning their babies, and instead, the very people you're paying to educate that woman are protecting a government policy. That needs to change right now. When children are born, they definitely have right to life. And we have the highest infant death rate, that's from zero to 12 months of age, and we have one of the highest infant death rates from one year to five years of age. What are our children dying of? And this should be something that everyone should be able to agree on and fight against. We need to eliminate this. We, and the causes. And if you look at it, the major cause of death, poor nutrition and intake of toxins. And we're seeing that at a full uh, rate in this country. We need, we need to uh, get into a major reevaluation of the ability of our health agencies to do their job. They're breaking us at the government level. They're making people sick. Our Medicare, our, our uh, care of children, the insurance costs, etc., are going through the ceiling. And here we have our health agencies inflicting major levels of toxins on us. And Congress does nothing about it. We have, to, we have to make this a major political issue, a major voting issue, and it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's an issue of how do you help American children live. Exposing a child to chemicals in the first six years of life that will harm that child's learning capability, self-control, and have effects on his brain function that are lifelong, to permit that to happen when you know it's happening and not to interfere by stopping the use of something like silicone fluoride, which makes it worse, is immoral. It is evil to harm children by poisoning them in the first six years of life once you know you're doing it. It wasn't evil to start uh, putting silicone fluoride in the water getting rid of a toxic chemical that was, uh, was a side waste product from waking weapons grade uranium, which just made America win the Second World War and saved literally hundreds of thousands of lives in invading Japan. Uh, I don't want to pretend that I can rewrite history. The critical thing is that once you discover that there's something you can change at relatively low cost that will help millions of human beings, you have an obligation to do it. So if we don't end water fluoridation now, we're going to continue to put children in harm's way. And we're also going to hurt pregnant women, senior citizens, individuals with health, other health conditions, African Americans, other minority groups, poor populations, and other people who deserve and who require fluoride-free water and who cannot afford to purchase a high-end reverse osmosis water filtration system or other kind of water system that can help to reduce the fluoride. And also, we need to get to the root cause of cavities, which are sugars and starches left on the teeth. We need to improve access to dental care and make sure that dental visits occur every year and dental cleanings occur twice a year. This is how we control cavities. It's not through fluoride. We don't have a knowledgeable, uh, scientific-based government health program overall. They're not looking at science because you cannot look at science and say it's okay to put two of the most neurotoxic 
cell to cellular toxic compound um, elements, fluoride and mercury in the body, and say it's okay. And they defend them. Our FDA has bent over backwards defending the use of fluoride and mercury, and they should be the ones out checking. Instead of that, it's citizens group who are activists who know a little bit of science that do this. And uh, we really need to get some support, and we need to get some support from Congress. The real problem is Congress just seems unlikely to do this because the lobbyists from these major corporations, the pharmaceutical firms, the fluoridation firms, the dental amalgam firms, can go and pay money to Congress to keep them and have them uh, ignore this problem. We need to fight that. We need to get a citizens activist group together to turn this over. I can think of no better way to destroy a nation than to spread toxic substances far and wide. In the 70s, we learned just how bad lead was for it after we've been exposed for more than 50 years. Now we're adding silico fluoride to the public drinking water, and that sucks lead into the bodies of the children. We have babies that are dying. 17,900 more babies die annually in the first year of life than they should or would otherwise if we protected the water supply. Why? We inject them on the day of birth with thimerosal, methylate, ethyl mercury. And then we put silico fluoride in the tap water formula that they drink, which sucks lead into their bodies. Remember the rats? Well, what if you don't kill the rat? Do you have children that can't learn to read and write, that have learning disorders? Yes, and you have damaged brains, but it's not just the children. The adults suffer as well because your body has no known use for lead, fluoride, or mercury, so it stores it in the bone if it can't get rid of it, and that destroys your joints. Why do you think we have all these joints being replaced in this country? Is it our great medical system, or is it because they're going bad because the bone is being poisoned? You can measure these elements in these diseased bones. This isn't going to stop until you make them. If you don't make them, they're going to keep doing it because it's making them billions of dollars. You've got to step up to the plate and go to work and save your country from industry, military, policies that are damaging the health of our nation. We are supporting a bill that Peter Villain Jr. and several other council members, members proposed last year. It is asking that unnatural fluoride be prohibited from New York City's tap water supply. There are many reasons why we support this bill. The addition of fluoride in our water is unethical. Nobody asks the citizens of New York City if they wanted fluoride in their tap water before putting it in. Fluoride's proposed purpose is to clean our teeth, meaning it is a medication. We are being forced medicated. This is why our class motto is, no fluoridation without representation. We are being medicated without being asked if we wanted to be. Fluoridation without representation. No.